So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about the heart, chapter 18. And uh, in this chapter, we're going to mostly focus on the anatomy of the heart in the beginning and then get into the physiology or basically how the heart works towards the end of this chapter. So if we look at this first slide here, what this shows is just like kind of like the basic anatomy of the heart where you see that, <clears throat> you know, its main function is to work as a muscular pump, right? It's made of cardiac muscle, but what it does is it receives blood from your body and then it pumps that blood out to your lungs where that blood can get oxygenated. That blood goes back to the other side of the heart where the other side of the heart pumps that blood out to the rest of your body. So what you guys find here then uh, are there two different uh, circulatory systems, right? They're interconnected, but they're two separate systems. So what you find here is what, one thing that's called a pulmonary circuit. And the pulmonary circuit are all the blood vessels that are associated with your lungs, right? So if you guys notice here that the right side of your heart pumps blood to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries, that blood gets oxygenated, and then the, the venous blood comes back to the heart uh, and then drains into the left side here. Now the left side of the heart is part of what we call the systemic circulation, and that pumps blood out to the rest of your body through your arteries, like systemic arteries, where your body's tissues can use that oxygen or you know nutrients, and then those veins converge back towards the heart where they drain back into the right side, right? So what we say then is that the right side of the heart receives blood from uh, your body, and it pumps that blood to the lungs to get oxygenated, and then the left side of your heart receives blood from the lungs, and then pumps that blood out to the rest of your body, right? So just kind of thinking about the difference between the two you guys, which, which side do you think would need to be stronger? The right side or the left side? The left, yeah. I mean, think about the left side of your heart's pumping blood out to the whole body, right? Pretty much all the rest of the tissues. So it's going to make it uh, such that it needs work much more strongly than the right side. However, both the right and the left sides of your heart actually pump the same amount of blood. But that kind of makes sense because they're interconnected. You know, like if you think about, well, if the right side of your heart was pumping more blood than the left, that means that blood would back up into the lungs, right? Or if the left side of your heart was pumping more blood than the right, which I don't even know how that would happen, but, you know, let's see if it could, uh, that means that blood would back up into the systemic circuit, you know, out in your veins. So it's kind of interesting. So in terms of the size of your heart, you guys, the, I know the models we saw in lab were, were kind of big. You know, I showed you guys on my chest how that were, wouldn't really fit that well. In reality, we say that the heart's about the size of a fist. You know, we know that like fist sizes can vary, uh, but approximately your heart is fist size, right? So it's not very big. Uh, it's located within the mediastinum, so the central portion of your thoracic cavity. Um, it sits just superior to the diaphragm. We talked about how there's a little flat portion on the, butt, the base of the heart that sits in the diaphragm. Uh, and we find that actually two-thirds of the heart is just to the left of your mid-sagittal line, right? So the mid-sagittal plane is right down the midline. Two-thirds of your heart is actually sits to the left of that. So we say that the heart is not that central. It's actually a little bit offset to the left, right? But that also makes sense because we talked about how the left lung was also smaller than the right because of the fact that your, that your heart is offset to the left. Um, now, if you guys look here in this picture, you can see that illustrated pretty well. So here's our mid-sternal line. And you can see that the heart, although it's, you know, somewhat mid-sternal, uh, two-thirds of it are offset to the left. Now, that's important to know because when we, when we go to, like, auscultate or listen for heart sounds, you know, you're listening for these on the left side of the body, not right in the midline. So you're, you're going to be listening for heart sounds between the second and fifth intercostal spaces um, on the left side, not the right. Uh, because you can hear those sounds better on the left because most of the heart sits towards the left, okay? Um, if you guys look here, we see that it sits right on top of the respiratory diaphragm. You know, the lungs would be here as well. And we talked about how organs that move a lot need to have like a lubricating membrane, right? So that the, the heart is also surrounded by a pericardium, which, all, which can lubricate the serous membrane <clears throat> because it moves around a lot, right? It's beating in there. It could potentially, you know, rub up against nearby tissues. So even the heart is surrounded by some serous membrane which you guys can really see here well in this cross-sectional image. So you can see our lungs here, and the lungs are right up against the heart itself. However, there's some tissue that's between the lungs and heart, which is made of serous tissue, and those things can lubricate, which prevents frictional injury between the heart and the lungs itself. So uh, you guys can see that also pretty well in this picture here. Do you guys see this whitish tissue that surrounds the heart? So what they did is they actually cut away some of the pericardium so you can see the heart itself. 
And um, we'll talk more about the pericardium here pretty soon. But one thing I wanted to point out to you guys right now is that uh, these vessels that are emerging um, kind of on the superior side of the heart, these are called the great vessels. Okay? So the great vessels would include things like your pulmonary trunk and your aorta. And these are called the great vessels because they're so big. And they take blood from the heart and carry that out to or towards the lungs, right? Or towards your body, depending on which one it is. Um, and you guys can see here there's some blood vessels that are on the surface of the heart as well. Those ones are called the coronary vessels. And the coronary vessels are blood vessels that supply blood to the heart itself, which sounds kind of weird because you think about like the heart as being, you know, an organ that pumps blood. And you think, oh, there's so much blood in there. Like, why doesn't it just get you know, it's nutrients from the blood it's pumping. Well, it turns out that it can't happen that way because the walls of the heart are too thick for that to happen so that the heart actually needs its own blood vessels that can actually go into the tissue of the heart and supply nutrients to the muscular tissue of the heart itself, right? Even though it's pumping blood, it needs its own blood vessels that go through the muscle tissue. Um, so for this pericardium we're talking about, you guys, there are two major layers of pericardium. We have a fibrous pericardium and a serous pericardium. Uh, the fibrous pericardium is not made of serous membrane. So it actually, it's actually made of a really tough fibrous tissue. And if I can describe what fibrous pericardium is like, I'd say that it's probably about as tough as duct tape, right? So if you guys have ever like, tried to like rip duct tape off, you know, the roll, it's pretty tough. I mean, like, you know, you get to really kind of really tear at it to get that duct tape to roll off the roll or tear off the roll, right? And so, and then also if you try to like just expand that duct tape, it won't just rip if you, if you pull on it, right? And so this fibrous pericardium is pretty tough. I'd say like on the order of duct tape kind of tough, right? So um, fibrous pericardium, it does not lubricate. That's not its function. What it does is it prevents overfilling of the heart. So here's the weird thing is that your heart receives a lot of blood flow, right? Now, when it receives that blood flow and the chambers start to expand, they can't expand forever because they can only expand into the space which is defined by the fibrous pericardium, right? So think about like the walls of this room as being the fibrous pericardium. You know, we can't expand beyond this because the walls are this tough outer layer, you might say, right? So that even if we wanted to kind of push up maybe against these walls or something, we won't go beyond that. So that what's really cool then is this fibrous pericardium prevents overfilling of the heart. Um, so that actually makes a lot of sense because if the heart filled with too much blood, it could potentially tear. And so um, this is a good thing mostly. However, one thing that can be bad though is what if fluid started to accumulate around the heart but inside of the fibrous pericardium? So then that fluid can't escape, right? So now you're saying you have fluid outside of the heart that's building up in the fibrous pericardium, but it's pushing down on the heart itself from the outside, right? And that would also sort of limit the heart's ability to fill. And those kinds of conditions we call things like cardiac tamponade, which I think we'll talk about here in a minute. I think it's in this chapter. So now that's the fibrous pericardium. It prevents overfilling. In fact, that's what we saw in this last slide here, you guys, this whitish layer. That's the fibrous pericardium here. It's pretty tough. We didn't see that on our sheep hearts during dissection in lab because they removed that stuff already. But there would be a fibrous pericardium there if, you, if it were like a whole body dissection. You'd see it there. You know, let's say if you did a thoracotomy and you look down in the thoracic cavity, you wouldn't just see a heart sitting there. You'd actually see it kind of like this fibrous sac. You need to cut that fibrous sac to even see the heart. It's sort of hidden within that. That makes sense. So uh, we, for the serous pericardium, though, there are two major layers. We have a parietal layer and a visceral layer, just like other serous membranes in our body, right? Remember, the visceral layer is right on the organ itself. That's why it's called visceral layer, because visceral means guts. And then um, the parietal layer is the layer that's outside of that, right? So what you'd find then is that the parietal layer is what's linked up with the fibrous pericardium. And this, this visceral layer is right on the outer surface of the heart. In fact, the visceral layer of serous pericardium is also called epicardium, which actually was on your dissection guide. If you guys remember learning about that, it's, it said like, you know, the epicardium was that kind of clear outer layer of the heart tissue itself. Um, it's kind of hard to identify, but uh, basically what it does is it, it, it anchors to the surface of the heart. That way when the heart's beating, the visceral layer and the parietal layer have a nice fluid membrane between the two. So the heart's actually not rubbing up against anything. It's lubricated within this uh, serous membrane. So what this looks like then, you guys, if we can kind of zoom in on it, 
So in that last picture we saw earlier, I pointed out the fibrous pericardium, right? How it surrounds the outside of the heart. Well, in order to really see these very well, we need to zoom in on that. So what they did in this picture is they say, okay, in this little region right here, let's zoom in on the pericardium and see what it looks like. And that's what you're seeing here, you guys. So this is the edge of the pulmonary trunk, which is one of the great vessels. Here's our fibrous pericardium. And so do you guys remember, what was the function of fibrous pericardium? It prevents overfilling. Good. And is it, is it weak or tough? It's tough. It's a tough fibrous tissue. Good. So that's the fibrous pericardium. And then deep to that, this is the serous membrane. And if y'all remember, serous membranes were a double layer. So if you guys look here, this is the visceral layer because it's right up against the organ. And then when it, when it wraps around like this, this is the parietal layer because it's right up against the fibrous pericardium. Okay. And then what would fill this space or pericardial cavity? Serous fluid, very good. So there's, there's actually a fluid layer in there, which is serous fluid. It's highly filtered blood plasma. So when the heart's beating, these layers don't rub up against each other. There's a nice fluid lubricant between the two so that when the heart's contracting, it's actually just sort of contracting within a, like a fluid membrane, if that makes sense. That's the pericardium. So this is the myocardium, which is cardiac muscle. And then deep to that, we have endocardium in here. And then this space would be one of the heart chambers. Like this is probably the left atrium right here. So this should be filled with blood. So you can see the heart muscle wall is not very thick. I mean, it's thick, but it's also not that thick. In some regions, you know, it's several millimeters thick, you know. Uh, in other regions, it's several centimeters thick. So its thickness can vary depending on where you're talking about. But here it's pretty thin because it's, it's in the atria. So um, one thing I wanted to point out, though, you guys, is if the serous membranes don't function properly, that can lead to pericarditis, right? So pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. So itis is inflammation. So pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium. And this can lead to what we call friction rub. And this can actually make audible noises, right? So if someone has pericarditis, sometimes you can hear this with a stethoscope because it sounds like a creaking noise when their heart contracts, right? So imagine with each heartbeat, instead of only hearing like a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Like imagine you hear kind of like a noise in there too. Like there's like this creaking kind of like screeching noise you might say. And the reason why that noise could be there is that if the pericardium is inflamed, it's not functioning like a lubrication membrane anymore. And so that those tissues are rubbing up against each other and it's making kind of like a creaking noise. So it's kind of interesting you can actually hear this with a stethoscope. So uh, one thing I pointed out earlier though is that what if too much fluid fills or sort of uh, accumulates around the heart? Well, that can lead to what we call cardiac tamponade. And cardiac tamponade is where you have excess fluid that's filling that pericardial space. And there's so much pressure now bearing down from outside the heart that the heart can't adequately fill, right? So for instance, like your heart needs to be able to expand to fill and then it contracts to eject that blood, right? But what if there's so much fluid around the heart that your heart can't adequately expand, right? So then it can't, very, it can't fill very well if it can't expand. So that's what cardiac tamponade is. Um, I've actually seen this before at the coroner's office. Uh, there's, a, there's a case of a motorcycle accident. This guy, I don't know what happened precisely, but uh, he was on a motorcycle and uh, didn't have a lot of external trauma other than the fact that his arm was twisted around. But he's wearing a lot of gear, you know, was wearing like, you know, his leathers and, you know, he had a chest plate kind of thing like for protection and a really nice helmet. But even that couldn't help him, you guys, because what happened was uh, due to the, like, the trauma of just getting ejected from the motorcycle and rolling around the ground a lot, uh, he ended up getting uh, fluid leaking out of blood vessels around his heart. So uh, he had cardiac tamponade from you know, blood that, that was leaking from around the heart, right? And so if blood starts to fill that space, then the heart can't adequately expand to fill, which means the heart can't function very well in the pump. So that, that's what they determined as the cause of death was cardiac tamponade because the heart couldn't fill adequately. And when they, when they were doing the autopsy, they actually just cut that, that fibrous pericardium and just, just blood just spilled out everywhere, you know? So it's kind of scary to see that. Like, that's one of the reasons why I don't, I've got a motorcycle license, but there's no way you're gonna find me on one of those things. Well, at least not, not around here, you know what I mean? Like, if it was out in the, like, the, the, the backwoods somewhere where like, you know, there's nobody else around, yeah, I'm down for that. But not in the city, no way. So, um, Anyways, you guys, uh, there's three layers of the heart wall. We talked about the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. What was another name for epicardium? Do you guys remember? 
What was the epicardium of the heart? It's the visceral layer of the serous membrane. Very good. So the epicardium is the same thing as the visceral layer of the serous membrane. So would this be superficial or deep on the heart? Superficial. Good. So the epicardium is superficial. The myocardium is in the middle. That's the heart muscle layer. And then the endocardium, endo means within, right? That's the, that's the layer of tissue that's, that actually um, uh, lines the spaces within your heart. Okay? And the endocardium is continuous with the endothelium of your blood vessels. So that means that, that the tissue that lines your blood vessels is the same tissue that, that lines the inside of your heart. There's no interchange. There's no, there's no change in tissue there. Now, epicardium is the visceral layer of serous pericardium, like we talked about earlier. So myocardium, you guys, is, is actually made of cardiac muscle. So going back to AMP1, do you guys remember, was cardiac muscle voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary, good. So it's under unconscious control of your autonomic nervous system. And then um, was it striated or smooth in appearance? It was striated. Remember, it's got, it had the striations because it has sarcomeres just like skeletal muscle. So if you guys forgot about the sarcomere contractions and all that, make sure you guys go back and, learn, and review sarcomeres because we're going to talk about sarcomeres again with heart muscle contraction because they're, they're back. They're here again, right? <laughs> We have we got sarcoplasmic reticulum. There's calcium. You know, there's troponin. There's tropomyosin. All that's here again in the heart because it shares those same anatomical features as skeletal muscle. Okay, but the difference here though with myocardium, you guys, is these cells are very short. They're not long like skeletal muscle cells. And what's kind of interesting too is that the myocardium of the heart actually spirals in the heart. So it makes these spiral-like bundles to the heart. And you guys will see a picture of this here pretty soon. In fact, oh, here it is. Just kidding. <laughs> so uh, these are the spiral arrangements of the heart of the myocardium. Like, I know we didn't see this in our sheep heart dissection because we didn't dissect it like this, you know. But if you really pick the part, the heart muscle, and kind of figured out the direction of those heart muscle cells, we would have seen that those muscle cells actually spiral around each chamber, right? So you can see that the muscle cells, they spiral around the two superior atria, and they kind of spiral around the apex of the heart down here, right? And so if you think about, okay, well, what the heck? Why would you want like ribbon-like spirals of muscle in the heart? Well, imagine if these cells contracted and they're in a spiral shape. Well, what that's going to do is it's going to squeeze, right? It's going to squeeze really well. And so <clears throat> when, the, when this muscle contracts and it squeezes on the blood that's in the, in the chambers there in the atria, it's going to force that blood down in the ventricles, right? And then down here in the ventricles, it, it's, a, it's arranged kind of differently, right? And do you guys notice that, that it spirals around the apex down here? So this spiral down here, and it kind of moves upward like this, means that the heart's going to contract from the apex and then contract up, right? So what happens then is that the heart's going to contract kind of like in an upward motion, kind of like this, which makes sense because you want to force that blood up and out of the heart, right? So... The endocardium is a simple squamous epithelium that lines the inside of your heart. It's continuous with endothelium, and uh, it also covers the valves of your heart. So if you guys hear of like endocarditis, you know, which is inflammation of the endocardium, uh, you're also concerned about valvular disease because the endocardium is also on your heart valves. It's a very sensitive tissue. It's very thin, right? So if y'all remember seeing that in our sheep heart dissections, I mean, that, that tissue is so thin on the valves, it was translucent. Like, you can see through those valves, right? In fact, if someone does get septicemia or, like, an infection of the blood and you're worried about endocarditis because of that, they can go on six months of IV antibiotics because you're worried about those heart valves getting damaged by uh, the bacteria because if those valves don't function like nice little floppy, clear, thin tissues anymore, and if, if, if instead they get all kind of shriveled up and scarified, right? Uh, they're not going to function like valves, which means you're going to, the next thing you'll have then is open heart surgery, which sounds pretty terrible. And so this is what that, this is what it can look like if you did have endocarditis and it affected the valves. So if you guys notice here, this is what, what the valve should normally look like, kind of just some thin, clearish looking tissue here. This is basically some scar tissue and inflammation that's developed on the heart valve itself from infection or trauma or autoimmune disease. I mean, there's a lot of things that can damage the endocardium, but you can see that, you know, there's this big lump here. Now, uh, this would prevent the valves from functioning like a valve, right? The valves should kind of flop on each other, but if there's a big old lump there, they're not going to close very well. And so then you're going to get, you know, inefficient blood flow 
which can be life-threatening. So that's why we're concerned about endocarditis. Uh, that's also why they're concerned about like strep throat, right? Because streptococcal bacteria can get into the bloodstream and for whatever reason, they love the endocardium. So they, sh they set up shop on the endocardium and that leads to inflammatory immune reactions that lead to scar tissue formation, which could prevent the valves from functioning properly. So could you guys imagine like going, like having strep throat and then a year later you're getting open heart surgery because of valvular disease. Like that can happen. That's why they're so concerned about strep throat. So uh, for the chambers of the heart, we have two atria and two ventricles, right? So there's four spaces in the heart, two superior atria, two inferior ventricles. Think about the atria as like the receiving chambers, right? The atria receive blood flow from veins of your body. And the ventricles are like the output chambers. They pump blood out of your heart through arteries of the body. Now, these, these atria and ventricles are separated by septa. So the interatrial septum separates the two atria from each other, which means you have a right atrium and a left atrium. And the interventricular septum is a wall that separates the two ventricles. So then you have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Okay? Now, when you're a fetus, there isn't much of an interatrial septum, actually. So in the little fetal heart, the interatrial septum isn't really present. And instead, you have a large hole there called foramen ovale. Now, when you're born and uh, you start to need, need to use your lungs to breathe, that uh, hole closes up and you're left with some scar tissue called fossa ovalis. And so fossa ovalis is identifiable on our models. I think we can even see it on the sheep part when we're looking at it, where it's basically where the foramen ovale used to be, but when you're born, that closes up, but there's still some scar tissue that remains, which we call fossa ovalis. And we'll talk about the, the relevance of that later. Uh, it plays a role in fetal blood circulation, but we'll come back to that later. So what this slide shows you guys, just kind of a nice sort of uh, review of the anatomy of the heart. So uh, what this slide shows, though, is a cutaway view of the heart where we can see our two atria right here and right here and our two ventricles right here and here. But the one thing that's important, you guys, when you look at the heart, you want to really orient yourself to whether you're looking at an anterior or posterior view and where's right versus left, right? So one of the things that I look for um, on these pictures or models is the aorta. So the aorta is this large vessel here. And you guys see that the aorta kind of bends this way towards the left. If you see that the aorta is bending towards the left, then you know that this is an anterior view of the heart. Because if from the anterior view, the aorta bends in a leftward motion, right? And so then, okay, if we know this is anterior and it's in the anatomical position, this is right and this is left, right? So that means that this is the right atrium and the right ventricle. And that means that this is the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now, if this were a posterior view of the heart and you're looking at the backside, the aorta would not appear to bend to the left. It would appear to bend to the right, right? So that's what we got to kind of like, kind of focus on. That's one thing I look for, but there's different things you can look at to determine, you know, anterior versus posterior views. You know, we typically assume it's an anterior view because that's anatomical position, just looking at somebody in that sort of orientation. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at models or dissection, you know, don't make those assumptions. You got to kind of figure out, well, am I looking at right versus left, anterior versus posterior? Okay. So do you guys see that the right atrium right here is associated with two large vessels here. These are called the vena cava. So superior vena cava is what drains all the blood that's superior to your respiratory diaphragm. And then the inferior vena cava drains all the blood that's inferior to your respiratory diaphragm. So obviously inferior vena cava is draining a lot more blood because there's way more of your body that's inferior to the respiratory diaphragm. You know, inferior vena cava is going to drain like all of your abdominal blood, all of the blood from your lower appendages. There's a lot more body below your diaphragm. Okay. Your superior vena cava would drain blood from like your head, your neck, your, your upper appendages, and some of the blood you'd find in the thoracic cavity that is not part of the pulmonary circulation. Okay? So when you think about the atria as being a receiving chamber, we say that the right atrium receives blood from the body, right? Like the rest of your body. Now, if these vessels are blue, what this means is they're carrying deoxygenated blood, right? So it kind of makes sense because the, the veins that are coming from your body uh, have already been deoxygenated because those tissues used that oxygen earlier. 
Now the right atrium would contract and force that blood into the right ventricle, and the right ventricle then pumps that blood up through the pulmonary trunk. Remember, blue means deoxygenated. But here's the thing though, you guys, is the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries are arteries not because they're carrying deoxygenated blood or oxygenated blood, but rather they're carrying blood away from the heart, right? So the pulmonary trunk and the, the two pulmonary arteries that branch off of that carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So this is one of the few examples of arteries in your body that carry deoxygenated blood, okay? But it's an artery because it's carrying blood away from the heart and it's higher pressure. So then if you guys look over here, this is the, the right, I'm sorry, the left atrium. And you guys see that there's pulmonary veins here that are associated with it. So the right and the left pulmonary veins drain blood into the left atrium. But you guys see that they're red. Now what red means is oxygenated blood, right? And so then uh, the left atrium then receives oxygenated blood via the pulmonary veins. And then our left atrium then pumps that blood into the left ventricle. Where the left ventricle can force that blood out of the heart through the aorta. And the aorta is the largest artery of your body, right? This big old one right here. In fact, it's actually bigger than a garden hose, which is, which is kind of cool. And do you guys see these valves right here? You can tell they're valves because they're kind of whitish. And the, the valves that have chordae tendinae attached are the ones we call atrioventricular valves because they separate the atria from the ventricles. The ones that don't have those cords are called the semilunar valves. And they separate the great vesicles, I'm sorry, the, the, <laughs> the great vessels from uh, the ventricles, okay? Those are the semilunar valves. We'll come back to those here in a minute. So the auricles are little appendages you find on the atria. Their function is they help increase the volume of the atria. Um, in fact, our right atrium also has some special muscle called pectinate, which you find in the left atrium as well. Uh, but the pectinate muscle is basically involved with just, you know, helping the atria contract completely and force that blood down in the ventricles. Now, the atria are small and thinly walled. And the reason being, you guys, is that um, most of the filling of your ventricles, like 80% of the filling that occurs in your ventricles, is not due to atrial contraction. So most of the blood that fills your ventricles is actually due to gravity. The atria only force the remaining 20% of that blood down in the ventricles. So you're saying that, 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 that the atria only contribute to 20% of the blood that fills the ventricles. So they don't play a very significant role with filling here of the ventricles, but they're really just like, you know, receiving chambers of blood flow, right? So if you'll remember, we said that the right atrium receives blood from your body via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. There's a third vessel there too, which is the coronary sinus. So the ostium of the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium too, but that's going to drain all the blood from the heart itself back into the right atrium. Right? That's the third one we drew on the board on Monday, or I'm sorry, on Tuesday in lab. So uh, there's four pulmonary veins, though, that drain into the left uh, atrium. And those pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood from each lung uh, back towards the heart. Okay. So for the ventricles, we say that the right ventricle kind of is more anterolateral. And it actually kind of makes up most of the anterior surface of your heart. The, the left ventricle is a little bit more posterior. So we're saying that the heart is, is kind of rotated, um, you know, leftward such that the right, H, the right ventricle is kind of the most anterior part of your heart. The left ventricle is a little bit more posterior, if that makes sense. So uh, in each ventricle, we find the trabeculae carnae, which are these irregular ridges of muscle. And we also find papillary muscle, remember? So papillary muscle is what's anchored to the chordae tendinae. And so uh, the chordae tendinae are basically what anchor papillary muscle to the atrioventricular valves. And we'll talk about their function also later in this chapter. So uh, for the ventricles, they have thicker walls than the atria. Why, why might that be? What do you guys think? Like, why would the ventricles need to have thicker walls than our atria? Yeah, they're pumping blood out of the heart much farther than the atria, right? If the atria are only, very good, if the atria are only pumping blood like maybe a couple centimeters from here to here, the ventricles have to pump blood maybe as far as like your tippy toes, right? or maybe all the way up and in, deep into your brain, right? So it's a, they have to pump blood a lot farther than the atria, which means they need more muscle, and they produce a higher pressure. So here's a weird thing, you guys, is that when your right ventricle contracts, it pumps the same amount of blood, but it pumps it at a lower pressure. Like your pulmonary circulation pressure is like 40 millimeters of mercury or so, right? 
What's your systemic blood pressure? Like, can you guys think of like a normal blood pressure? What's the high number there? Yeah, 120. So you're saying it's three times greater pressure that's generated by your left ventricle than your right. And, but we will talk about why that's necessary and important because you don't want high, too high of pressure in your lungs <clears throat> because you can actually uh, force, start to force fluid into your lung tissue, which means you can start to ch kind of choke on your own fluids, which wouldn't be very good. So uh, if you guys look here, here's our right atrium. I'm sorry, left, uh, right ventricle, left ventricle. And so the right ventricle would actually eject blood out of the heart via the pulmonary trunk. And then where does the pulmonary trunk carry blood towards? You guys remember? The lungs. That's why it's called the pulmonary trunk. Makes sense. And then if this is the left ventricle here, and it's associated with the aorta, where does the aorta carry blood towards? The body. The rest of your body. Good. Exactly. Awesome. Good job, you guys. And then here's those auricles we saw earlier, or talked about earlier. So the auricles are little appendages of the atria, which you can see here. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the coronary vessels as well on the surface of your heart. Now, this is showing a real human heart kind of in dissection, and you can see some coronary vessels here as well. This is the left ventricle, the right ventricle. You can see our auricles, and you can see it's not very big, right? You can see it's about the size of a fist or so, uh, but it's pretty amazing. Uh, the heart over the course of your lifetime would pump about an Olympic-sized swimming pool volume of blood. That's a lot. It's, you know, it's hundreds of millions of gallons, so it's kind of amazing, or more than that. Um, so if you guys look on the inside of the heart, though, we can see our trabeculae carnae. Here's our cornea tenone with the uh, papillary muscle attached down here. That would make these valves one of the atrioventricular valves. Now, when you guys look at a heart dissection, the way you can tell right versus left from dissection, do you all remember? Which one's going to be thicker, the right side or the left side? The left side's thicker, right? And you guys see, can see how thin the right side is here versus the left side's much thicker. And so you can tell them that this is, the, this is the right ventricle wall because it's thinner. And it's thinner because the right ventricle doesn't have to pump blood very far. It just pumps blood to the lungs. Now, we do have a bunch of valves in the heart. In fact, there are four heart valves. We have two atrioventricular valves and two semilunar valves. So the atrioventricular valves separate the atria from the ventricles. And the semilunar valves separate the ventricles from their great vessel, right? Now, these valves open and close at the same time. So if you guys know like a heartbeat, go, it goes lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, right? The lub noise in lub dub is when both atrioventricular valves close at the same time. And the dub sound is when both semilunar valves close at the same time. So that's important to note. It's not like we, each of these valves only closes once at a time, because if that were the case, you'd have four heart sounds, right? But we only have two heart sounds normally. And so then that means that the first one is when both AV valves close. Both atrioventricular valves close at the same time, making a lub noise, right? And so uh, there are two AV valves. We have a tricuspid and our bicuspid valve. So the tricuspid valve is the right atrioventricular valve, and it separates the right atrium from the right ventricle, and it prevents backflow of blood into the right atrium while the right ventricle is contracting. So when the right ventricle contracts and it forces blood, the right AV valve closes to prevent backflow of blood into your veins, right? Now, the mitral valve, aka left atrioventricular valve, aka bicuspid valve, uh, prevents backflow of blood from the left ventricle back into the left atrium. So it prevents blood from bl flowing back into the lungs, which is pretty important too. And so, um, you know, in anatomy, usually it's pretty easy to remember, like, right atrioventricular valve, right? It makes sense. It separates the right uh, atrium from the right ventricle. Or the left atrioventricular valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. They have different names, but you want to know the different names for each of these valves, too, because people use the ones they like to use. So, um, chordae tendinae are like the heart strings, right? And the chordae tendinae are what link up with the AV valves, and they go all the way down from the AV valves to something called papillary muscle. And the function of papillary muscle is it ensures that there, you keep tension on those chordae tendinae, which keeps the valves closed while your ventricles are contracting. So it's like pulling on the strings to prevent the valves from actually you know, bursting through or bursting open, if that makes sense. So they hold those valve flaps in position. So this is what the AV valves would look like. And to me, it kind of looks like DIA. You guys see that? 
here. It's like upside down DIA. <laughs> um, so each one of these is the valve leaflet, right? And so this is an open valve, and this is trying to show that blood would be filling the ventricle. But let's imagine for now that, that the left ventricle starts to contract, and when that, when that ventricle starts to contract, it starts to force blood kind of up. Now blood, like air, flows from high pressure to low pressure, right? So let's think about this, you guys. If the ventricle began to contract and it started to produce a bunch of high pressure in here, and there's low pressure in the atrium, where does that blood want to flow? Back into the atrium, right? From high to low pressure. But you don't want to have blood flow back because then that's not very effective, right? So what we have then are these valves that basically catch that blood as it tries to flow back in the atrium, right? You guys see that? It's got like a little, like, uh, it, to me, it kind of looks like a, a kite or something, or you know, it, you can see that there, there's a curvature to the to the valve, such that when the blood forces up against these valves, the valves catch that blood, but it causes the valve to close as a result, right? Because when the blood tries to flow back, due to the shape of the valve, it catches it, but it prevents it from flowing back because it locks into position once it catches it. Now, what keeps it locked in position though are these chorda tendineae, which you guys can see here, right? So what prevents this valve from prolapsing or basically getting pushed backwards is that it's held in this position by the chorda tendineae. In fact, the papillary muscle here contracts and it pulls down and it pulls, it creates tension on those chorda tendineae to also hold that valve in position. Because if you didn't have papillary muscle holding those valves in position, the valves could actually get pushed up like that, right? And it can push, it can prolapse, which means the, then blood would flow backwards. So you, would, you don't want that. That's the function of our papillary muscle here. Okay. Now, uh, what heart sound is created when those valves close? The AV valves. Love, the first heart sound, right? So these valves, when they close, you guys, they close with so much force. Love, right? But they both close at the same time. So this is just looking at the left side, but even the right AV valve would also close at the same time because both the right and the left ventricles contract at the same time. Okay. All right. So we also have some semilunar valves here too. They're called semilunar valves because they look like, you know, like, like a half moon, you might say, like semi-lunar, right? Um, and so uh, we have two semilunar valves. We have aortic and pulmonary semilunar valve. Do you all remember, what does the aortic pulmonary semilunar valve separate? What does the aortic pulmonary semilunar valve separate? Good. So the aortic semilunar valve separates the aorta from the left ventricle, right? And so what this would do then is prevent backflow of blood from the aorta back into the left ventricle. And we'll talk about how that works here in a minute. Then what about the pulmonary semilunar valve, you guys? What does that separate? The pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle. Very good. And so the pulmonary semilunar valve prevents backflow from the pulmonary trunk back into the right ventricle. That way the blood can't flow back into the ventricle. Okay. Now, what's weird about these semilunar valves is they do not have chordae tendineae. There's no papillary muscle here. They basically just catch blood, and it works just fine like that. So if you guys look here, um, right here, we're seeing that blood's being ejected out of the heart. And I think this, this is showing the pulmonary semilunar valve. So while the right ventricle is contracting, that blood's being forced out of the heart through the pulmonary trunk. You guys can see it's going through the valve. But then when the ventricle begins to relax and the blood pressure is higher in the pulmonary trunk and lower in the right ventricle, that blood wants to try to flow back, right? Because it, it wants to go from high to low pressure. But you guys see that the shape of these valves would kind of catch that blood? See that? See they form like a little cusp, right? So when the blood tries to flow back, those cusps just catch the blood. And when those cusps catch the blood, their weight kind of pushes up against each other and they all kind of fold into each other, and they form a nice tight valve there that prevents blood from, bl from flowing back into the uh, right ventricle, which makes sense, right? Now, when those semilunar valves close, they close with so much force, it creates an audible sound. What sound is that? That's the dub, which is S2. That's the second heart sound, right? In fact, what's also kind of cool to you guys is that when the aortic semilunar valve closes, it closes with so much force, it not only creates an audible sound, but it also creates a pressure wave 
you can measure with a blood pressure cuff. So like let's say if you're measuring someone's blood pressure, you would see that their blood pressure would temporarily spike when those when that aortic stem inner valve closes. Because when the aortic stem inner valve closes, it slams down with so much force, there's a pressure wave that's transmitted throughout your blood vessels, and you can measure that. It's called the dichrotic notch. And we'll talk about that later. It's pretty awesome. Okay, guys, so this is showing all the valves kind of linked up in the same plane. So you can see our two atrioventricular valves and our two semilunar valves. So uh, which ones would open and close at the same time? So they're all closed right now, which is interesting. But uh, let's say that if the heart were filling with blood, um, which valves would be open? What do you guys think? Actually, maybe not at that point yet. I should ask that question. Uh, let's say if the ventricles were filling with blood, which which uh, which valves would need to be open? Yeah, the, both atrioventricular valves, right? Now, if they're closed, are the ventricles currently filling with blood? No, they can't. Because if the blood comes from the atria and those valves are closed, then there's no blood flowing in the ventricles. Okay. Um, now, if these semilunar valves are both closed... Uh, do you have blood being ejected from the heart? No, because if these valves are closed, there's no blood leaving the heart, right? Because it can't leave through a closed valve, right? So this is kind of a weird period in time where the heart's not filling, I'm sorry, the ventricles aren't filling with blood, nor are the ventricles pumping blood out of the heart, and all the valves are closed. In fact, we would call this a state called isovolumetric relaxation phase, where the ventricles aren't filling, nor are they ejecting blood. So it's isovolumetric uh, relaxation phase. It's kind of interesting. But all the valves are closed. This could also be isovolumetric contraction phase too, but we'll come back to that later. But it's a period of time when all the valves are closed and the ventricles are either relaxing or contracting. Okay? But we'll come back to that later. All right, guys, so this is actually a really neat picture. And you can actually, you're looking inside the ventricle, right? So you can see some papillary muscle with some chordae tendinae. And what do these chordae tendinae link up to? Like, what would be up here? No, this is papillary muscle. The atrioventricular valve, right? Do we know if this is right or left? No, we can't tell from this picture. There's not really much indication of, other than the fact that we got some papillary muscle here, whether this is right or left. But if you guys look here, we have one, two, three. It's probably the tricuspid valve, right? Because there's three cusps, and there's three sets of papillary muscle that would link up to those valves. So is tricuspid valve on the right or left? Yeah, the tricuspid valve is also called the right atrioventricular valve. Very good. Okay, so looking at this cross section here, we can see that the left ventricle is much thicker than the right. And that actually makes sense because the left ventricle has to pump blood out of the heart. By the way, this is not a normal thickness. Like this is much thicker than normal, and this would be indicative of cardiac hypertrophy, which is something that can happen with high hypertension or high blood pressure. So that's this is not a normal thickness of the heart. This is way too thick um, for the left ventricle. So <clears throat> for uh, incompetent valves versus stenotic valves, we're talking about valves that don't work properly, right? So if a if a valve is incompetent, that means it's allowing for backflow. And so let's think about this, you guys. What do you all think would happen if the left atrioventricular valve were incompetent and it did allow for some backflow of blood? It's going to backflow into the left atrium and then backflow in the lungs, right? That's going to put a lot of pressure in your lungs because now, you're, now your right side of your heart has to fight against that higher pressure because your left side of your heart is actually pumping blood backwards towards the lungs instead of out of your body, right? What about... Um, if your left atrioventricular valve were incompetent, what's going to happen there? Blood's going to flow back where? Towards the body, right? In fact, when that happens, sometimes you can see a jugular venous pulse. So normally, venous veins don't pulse. Okay? But sometimes, though, if the right atrioventricular valve is incompetent and blood starts flowing back to where it came from, you're actually getting pulses of the jugular vein. And you can find that with certain types of heart failure or incompetent valves. So it's kind of interesting. And so if you see someone's jugular vein kind of pulsating, not normal. <laughs> that should not happen. <laughs> so that could be from a, a valvular incompetence, right? Which could be from like strep infections. Remember we said that strep infects the endocardium. 
So that's a little scary. All right, so what about valvular stenosis? We're saying that stenotic valves are stiff and they don't open fully, right? So if the valves don't open completely, what, what does this mean for blood flow from like, let's say the right atrium to the right ventricle? If the valves can't open all the way, will the blood flow to your right ventricle be the same or less? Much less. So where's the blood gonna back up then? Into your veins of your body. In fact, you're gonna see big old venous distension throughout your body too. So you can see your jugular veins might be distended and you might even have distension of the abdomen because of the veins in your abdomen that aren't really draining the blood very well because the right side of your heart's not able to accept that blood flow as well. So when you guys take um, pathophysiology, uh, you know, we're gonna go under these kind of conditions in more detail, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, valvular replacement though, can be like mechanical, it can be zoonotic, like from another animal, or even from a cadaver, which would be, you know, so like a tissue donor. Are, have you guys signed up for like organ tissue donation? Yeah. So like, let's say if any of us died somehow prematurely and we still had like young, healthy tissues, you know, uh, they could potentially harvest our heart valves to help somebody else and make sure that their heart wor works properly. So it's kind of cool. Um, honestly, you guys, I would probably rather have the cadaver valve just if I had to choose between them all because at least this is made of real tissue and real tissue can heal itself, right? Uh, the mechanical valves don't self-heal, which means that they wear out over time just like all mechanical things do, right? So... Uh, they don't last that long. And um, they also make a kind of a loud noise, which is interesting. Like you can hear mechanical valves through someone's chest sometimes because they have this little ball bearing in there. It goes and it goes up and down with the movement of blood. And uh, it actually makes an audible sound, which is interesting. So it sounds like, they, sounds, like they, well, it sounds like their chest is ticking, you know. It's kind of interesting. What animal? What animal? Usually like pigs or something because they have very similar um, haplotype. Yeah, good question. All right, guys, so what, this what these next slides do is take us through the blood flow of the heart. So let's go through this together. And we're going to do one big loop, right? So it's going to go start. We didn't have to pick a starting point. The starting point we're going to pick here is from the vena cava. But honestly, you can pick any starting point in the circulatory system and then trace its way through the heart and back again, okay? So here, we're saying that blue means deoxygenated blood or oxygen-poor blood, right? So what are the three places that your right atrium receives blood from. Do you guys remember? Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. What does this coronary sinus drain blood from? Do you all remember? The coronary veins of your heart. Very good. Okay. So that means the right atrium receives blood flow from three different areas. <clears throat> the right atrium then pumps blood into the right ventricle, and then where's that right ventricle going to pump the blood? Well, the right atrium pumps blood in the right ventricle, and then blood, the, the blood's going to be pumped where? Okay, good. The next one's the pulmonary trunk. So here's our right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, oh, by the way, when the right ventricle contracts, what's going to happen to this AV valve? It should close to prevent backflow. Good. But then when the right ventricle contracts, it also needs to produce enough pressure to get the semilunar valves to open. So you're going to find that there's a period of time where the AV valve is closed and the semilunar valve is still closed even though the ventricle is contracting because the right ventricle and left ventricle still have to produce enough force to get the semilunar valves to open up. Even though the atrioventricular valves have closed, that period of time when the semilunar valves are closed and the AV valves are closed but the ventricle is contracting, it's called isovolumetric contraction phase. And it starts at lub. Remember it goes lubbed up. And what's, what's the lub sound again? Do you remember? The closing of the AV valves, good. So when the AV valves close, um, that makes that lub sound, but that's the beginning of the isovolumetric contraction phase where all the valves are closed at that point, okay? Then that blood gets ejected out of the heart through the pulmonary trunk via the pulmonary arteries, and then where does it go from the pulmonary arteries? To the lungs, good. Once in the lungs, what happens to that blood? It gets oxygenated. Good. So oxygenation there occurs in the capillary beds of our lungs. We already talked about how that works at the level of alveoli with gas exchange at the respiratory membranes, right? Uh, and then that oxygenated blood comes back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, and there's four of them, two on either side. So there's two left and two right pulmonary veins, and they drain into the left atrium. And uh, basically, the left atrium receives that blood. Where's the, where's the left atrium going to pump its blood into? Left ventricle. 
But do you guys remember how much of the of the blood that fills the ventricle is actually due to atrial contraction? Do y'all remember? Only 20%. You got it. So if we go to the next slide, you guys, see how the ventricle is full here now? 80% of the blood that's in this ventricle right now is not because the atria contracted. It's just that it fell down due to gravity. So gravity just kind of pulled that blood flow down with it. Okay? And then when the atria contract, they force the remaining 20% of that blood in the ventricle. That's it. So atrial contraction does not contribute that much to ventricular filling. And that's important to know because we'll talk about disorders of the heart later. So when the, when the left ventricle contracts, what's going to happen then? Good, it's going to force blood out through the aorta, through the aortic semilunar valve. But before that happens, what's going to happen with this left AV valve? It's got to close. Nice. So when that left AV valve closes, what closes? What what noise is going to occur? No, it's still love because it's still AV valve. I know. Here's the thing, though. Remember, remember how we just talked about how blood in the right ventricle, when it contracts, the right AV valve closes, and that makes a love sound. Okay. But here's the, the thing is when you look at blood flow in this linear pathway, what we're not realizing is that, hey, guess what? There's also blood in the right side here. Okay? So the right ventricle and the left ventricle contract at the same time, which means that both AV valves close simultaneously. This picture doesn't show that, right? Because I think, it, I, I think in some ways it could get kind of confusing if you start thinking about, well, what are the activities that are happening on both sides of the heart at the same time? They're the same exact thing, though, you guys. Whatever the right side's doing, the left side's doing as well. Okay? So if the left ventricle is contracting, what's happening to the, the right ventricle? It's also contracting. So if the left AV valve is closing, what's happening to the right AV valve? It's also closing. So that means that your lub noise is made of the simultaneous sound of both the left and the right AV valves closing at the same time. Okay, cool. And then that, that blood gets ejected out to the aorta. Right, where it goes to the, the body. Right Now, we have a whole chapter on the blood vessels that are associated with our aorta and where that takes blood to and what organs they go to. But we're not talking about that yet. We're just talking about the heart. So for now, just want to know that the aorta takes blood to the body. And then that's where the magic happens, where the oxygen is delivered. Right? And then um, where does that blood go next? Well, it delivers that oxygen to your body's tissues, but then it drains into veins, and then these veins go back to the... The veins of your body go back to the heart and they drain into the, the right atrium. So now we're back again, you guys. We're back to where we started. Remember we said the right atrium receives venous blood from your body? Well, here's the venous blood from your body. But that venous blood from your body came from the aorta, right? Because the aorta brought it there. And then the aorta brought blood from the left ventricle. Left ventricle received blood from the left atrium. Left atrium received blood from the lungs. The lungs receive their blood from uh, the pulmonary arteries, which came from the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk received its blood flow from the right ventricle, which received it from the right atrium, which received its blood from the body. So it went full circle, right? So what type of circulation is the right side of your heart involved with? We said there is a pulmonary and the systemic circulation. So the right side of your heart contributes to which one? The pulmonary circulation, right? Good. Uh, which is this one here, you guys. So all of these events here, that's pulmonary circulation, where it's still in blue. And it's blue because it's deoxygenated. And then all of these events down here, that's systemic circulation, which is the left side of your heart, right? So if you have left-sided heart failure, where's the blood going to back up into? The lungs. And then what's not going to get as much blood flow? Your body. Very good. So what do you guys think? would be some of the signs and symptoms of left-sided heart failure if blood's backing up in the lungs. Something to do with blood backing up in the lungs, right? So what we find then is, are things like crackles and rails, and that's basically where there's so much blood backing up in the lungs that fluid, plasma, starts to get forced into your airways, and you start to basically kind of like gurgle and like maybe, uh, you know, kind of cough on your own fluids in your lungs, and that makes noises. So, yeah, you definitely don't want that. All right, guys, cool. So you remember how we said that it's kind of this weird example where we said the heart's pumping all this blood, but the heart needs its own blood flow. And the reason being is that the heart muscle is pretty thick, 
And although there's a lot of blood inside the heart, it can't receive an, enough oxygen from that blood itself on the inside. So what we find then is that we have, um, you know, we have pulmonary, uh, not pulmonary, we have coronary vessels that supply blood to the heart itself. And um, I was also talking about earlier, you guys, that the, uh, the right side of your heart pumps blood to the lungs, left side of your heart pumps blood to the body. Now, each one of these pumps equal volumes of blood, but we find the left ventricle is three times thicker than the right, right? And it pumps with greater pressure because it's pumping blood out to the rest of your body, whereas the right side of your heart's only pumping blood to the lungs. And you guys can see that illustrated pretty well here. Like, left ventricle is way thicker than the right, but they pump equal volumes of blood, which is interesting. So with coronary circulation, we say that the, that the uh, blood supply to the heart is mediated by these coronary vessels. Coronary arteries emerge from the aorta, and the coronary veins emerge from the um, heart muscle tissue itself. And those coronary veins all converge back together, and they drain back into the right atrium. Okay? So one of the first branches of the aorta are the coronary arteries, with the right and left coronary arteries. right? And so the left coronary artery emerges from the left side of the aorta, and it branches immediately into an anterior interventricular artery, which is also called the left anterior descending, or LAD, and the circumflex artery, which actually wraps around the heart laterally, like to the left, okay? But it branches pretty immediately. So technically, the left coronary artery is a pretty thin segment, or short segment. Maybe it's a centimeter long, okay? But it comes right off the aorta. Now, the right coronary artery comes off the aorta to the right, and it's actually pretty long, because it wraps around the heart towards the right, going through coronary sulcus, it's got the right marginal branch that supplies the right ventricle, and as it wraps around towards the back side of the heart, it becomes the posterior interventricular artery, also called the right posterior descending. Okay? So if you look at a picture of that here, you guys, here's our aorta, and the aorta is bringing oxygenated blood from the left ventricle out to the body. Okay? Well, the heart would include what we define as body. So immediately, this is already a body part that's being supplied by your aorta. So what happens is these vessels that come off the aorta, there's two main ones. We have the left and the right coronary arteries. The left coronary artery branches into the anterior interventricular artery because it goes between the two ventricles in this interventricular sulcus and the circumflex artery which wraps around the posterior side of the heart. Okay? Now the left coronary artery supplies blood to the majority of the left ventricle. So think of that, this as being left-sided. So if someone has a blockage in, in any of the branches of the left coronary artery, start thinking left-sided structure injury, right? Now, the right coronary artery, which comes off the right side of the aorta, that wraps around through coronary sulcus, and it gives rise to the right marginal branch, which then supplies blood to most of the right ventricle, and then it wraps around the back side of the heart, where it actually turns into the posterior interventricular artery, which also goes between the two ventricles, but it supplies blood to the majority of the posterior side of your heart as well, okay? So what we find here, guys, is that there's actually four major arteries for the heart. Let's count them out, you guys. So what are the two first ones? Left coronary artery and right coronary artery, and then each of those branches into two, right? So what are the two branches of your left coronary artery called? Anterior interventricular artery. In clinical medicine, they usually say um, left anterior descending or LAD. And then what about this one? Circumflex, because it kind of circumnavigates the heart or on the side, right, to the left. What are the two branches of your right coronary artery called? Right marginal branch and the posterior interventricular artery. So this is what we talk about when someone has like a quadruple bypass. They're bypassing all four of those major branches because there's a blockage in all four of those arteries. So that would require pretty extensive heart surgery, okay? If someone just has like a double bypass, they're just going over two, they're just going around two blockages, right? So uh, you can't have more than a quadruple bypass because there's only four major arteries to go around. So that makes sense. That's why if you've, you've never heard of like someone getting like a quintuple bypass or an octuple bypass, you know, it's not going to happen. So, all right, guys. So the coronary veins are the vessels that then carry that blood from the heart muscle itself and then converge and bring that back into the right atrium, okay? So what we find then with the coronary veins, or aka cardiac veins, is that we have three major veins, and they're actually nicely paired with the arteries that we talked about, okay? So the great cardiac vein is what pairs with the anterior interventricular artery, 
The small cardiac vein is what pairs with the right marginal artery, and the middle cardiac vein is what pairs with the posterior interventricular artery. And they all come together to form what's called the coronary sinus, which is a gigantic vein on the posterior side of your heart. And what a sinus is, is basically a large chamber that stores blood, right? So if you guys look here on this slide, we see here is our great cardiac vein. It's going to carry blood towards the back side of the heart. Here's our middle cardiac vein. It's going to carry that blood towards the coronary sinus. And our small cardiac vein, again, you guys, carries that blood, again, towards coronary sinus. And then where does coronary sinus drain that venous blood into? The right atrium. You got it. Very good. And that makes a lot of sense because guess what? This blood is deoxygenated now. The heart used the, the nutrients that are in that blood. And so it would make sense then to bring that blood back into the right atrium and put that back into the pulmonary circulation to get oxygenated again. It wouldn't make sense to drain this blood like into the, le into the left atrium because now you're mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So those are the, those are the coronary veins there, guys. So it, those are pretty important to note too.